Ladies and gentlemen, it's two o'clock Finnish time and we are ready to start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, I'm happy to welcome you to our webinar, Integration in Minority Languages, Benefits and Challenges. I am Kristina Jestrin, the Secretary General of the Swedish Assembly of Finland or Folktinget, as we say in Swedish. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome both our distinguished speakers and all of you participants who are joining us on this webinar today. My role is to guide us through the webinar, the program and keep an eye on the time. We will round off the discussion of, uh, at about uh, 15.30 Finnish time. So I ask all of our speakers to keep to the given time for the presentations. So let's begin with the, uh, today's program. Uh, and as we are quite a few, uh, we will have the microphones on mute. And uh, please also the cameras uh, closed, except of course for the speakers uh, when you speak. Uh, and But it's possible for you to, to comment on the chat. So let me first of all introduce you to Sandra Barikvist and uh, Agustina Villaret Gonzalez for welcoming remarks. Sandra Barikvist is a member of the Finnish Parliament and the chairperson of Folktinget. Uh, please, Sandra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and uh, greetings from the archipelago uh, between Turku and Åland Islands. I'm sitting here on uh, one of those islands. But dear all, I'm so delighted to welcome you all to this webinar about integration and minority languages and what the benefits and challenges are in doing so. And I must say how happy I am that this webinar has gained so much interest. As the chair of the Swedish Assembly of Finland, or Folktinget, as we call it in Swedish, I can say with great pride that integration and language is an issue we worked systematically with for quite a long time. Our aim is to promote and clarify the Swedish integration path in Finland. We want to be part in creating sustainable structures for integration and inclusion in Swedish in Finland. And it goes without saying that we do this in collab collaboration with several other organizations, with municipalities and other, uh, other authorities. I naturally also strongly believe that migrants need to be heard systematically when it comes to designing integration services and people, people's individual wishes and choices should be supported by correct information. Besides lobbying work and awareness raising work, which are of course also crucial, Folktinget annually arrange a large conference on integration in Swedish with high level speakers and creative workshops. These conferences attract a large number of people from all over Finland, working with integration on different levels. The participants scales from NGO representatives and activists to authorities and politicians. At Folktinge, we are seeking new best practices. We believe in sharing experiences, both good and bad, and we think that discussion and inclusion is key to progress. And that is the reason we want to arrange today's webinar. To hear examples and learn from uh, other countries and regions. How are you handling a situation where an immigrant is to be integrated in a bilingual society? What politics are there when it comes to integration in the lesser used language? And what tools do you use to allow the individual to have a successful integration? 
Finland was a long a country of emigration, with a million Finns moving abroad in the 20th century. However, its population has always represented many cultures and languages, not least due to the country's geographical location between East and West. International immigration for humanitarian reasons began in the 1970s with refugees from Chile and Vietnam. With the arrival of larger numbers of refugees in the 1990s, integration pol uh, policies began to take shape, particularly in the Helsinki region. Compared to its Nordic neighbors, the number of foreign-born inhabitants in Finland remains low, about 7%. In Sweden, almost 20% of the population was born abroad, while the figure in Norway is approximately 14% and in Denmark, 13%. The goal of Nordic integration programs is for participants to learn the national language and enter the labor market or engage in further studies as quickly as possible. The services are based on individual plans and are free of charge for the participants. Sweden is often perceived as an earlier language to learn compared to Finnish. As an Indo-European language, Swedish is closer to English and German, making it easier to learn for those who already speak an Indo-European language. However, when choosing a language, the area in which the immigrant wants to live should be taken into consideration. There are 33 bilingual municipalities in Finland, the majority of which are located in Ostrobotnia and southern Finland. Although Swedish is used more visibly in Ostrobotnia, the number of native speakers of Swedish is highest in Helsinki. The Swedish, Swedish language can be used in bilingual municipalities with central and local government authorities. In municipalities where Swedish is spoken more widely than Finnish, residents may get by using only Swedish. However, fully Swedish-speaking jobs are rare in the regions of Uusima and Southwest Finland. Therefore, it's often also important to learn Finnish, as it is the pre predominant language of the labor market in Finland. Integration training provided in Swedish sometimes also includes Finnish language studies. I want to conclude by saying how much I look forward to hearing your thoughts and experiences with integ uh, integration in a lesser used language and also express my gratitude to all our excellent speakers here today for taking the time to share your knowledge. Once again, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra Berikvist. And now it's a pleasure for me to give the floor to Agustina Villaret Gonzalez. She's the chair of the network to promote linguistic diversity and the regional secretary of university research and language policy of the government of the Balearic Islands. She's working as high school teacher of history in Catalan. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Estrin. Dear Ms. Uh, Gersquit, Bersquit, and member of the Swedish Assembly uh, of Finland, and dear Ms. Gestrin, Secretary General of Foltinger, dear friends, uh, I want to first thank uh, our friends from Foltinger, both for inviting me to address these welcoming words and for organizing this webinar at such an opportune and difficult time. When I heard that Foltinget uh, was working on a webinar on integration and minority languages, I was more than happy for two reasons. Firstly, firstly because I do believe that challenges that immigration poses to societies in general and to bilingual or multilingual communities in particular in terms of reception and social and linguistic integration uh, demands uh, a thorough and sudden uh, reflection. And secondly, because I feel especially concerned 
about this topic since I come from an hospitable country, Balearic Island, that has doubled uh, its population in the past 40 years, which uh, has required a remarkable effort. I was saying before that the large number of migrants reaching Europe poses great challenges. On the one hand, it may imply a risk for the minority uh, uh, language, and on the other hand, it may also lead to a fragmentation of the society. Europe uh, has great uh, linguistic and cultural diversity. There are over 80 autochthonous uh, languages inside the European Union's borders. Many of them are minority languages and uh, lack any official status. It is evident that if a large number of migrants arrive in a territory where two languages coexist and where one is the dominant uh, socially, this can pose a risk for the minority language. The newcomer may opt for the dominant language as a means of social integration, leaving the minority one on one side. That situation can exacerbate the minority situation of the language even further. The diversity of languages spoken by migrants which is one aspect of the rich multilingual and multicultural nature of contemporary European societies, also presents a challenge to education system in relation to teaching the official language and maintaining their mother tongues too. Failure to properly manage migration flows and their impact on minority languages could result in minority languages suffering a clear and negative impact. How shall we tackle then the challenges that multilingualism entails for lesser used languages? Both the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities, uh, Article 14, and the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages, Article 7, provide some elements of great interest. I will suggest starting by recognizing the linguistic diversity. The very core of the potential to act as a citizen informed by communicative resources. Citizens need to be equipped with such resources to be able to act in autonomous and enlightened ways, to participate in collective deliberation and to influence decision making locally, nationally and transnationally. Multilingual society must be sensitive to this embeddedness and recognize the important language has for the constitution of the personal and social identities for their inhabitants. Recognition must not be taken as a means for segregating different groups according to their cultural attributes. Recognition aims at working out on approach for dealing with the challenges of diversity that is primarily inspired by the democratic uh, motives. The openness of institutions for the articulation of different identities is meant in the end to be conducive to the creation of a shared civic space with both respects and transcends the diversity. Because recognizing different cultural and linguistic identity is not just a legitimate end in itself, but a decisive step for creating reciprocal attachment among those supposed to participate in the making of, of a vibrant public culture. A culture that will imply some common standards, including linguistic standards. However, it has to be emphasized that such standards but must be developed without replicating the homogenizing logic that characterized the model of the European nation state. I should not like to finish my intervention without thanking once again to Foltinger for such a great initiative. I wish you very success in this webinar. Uh, Molte gracias. Thank you. Uh, Taxa Mike and Kigitos Palion. Thank you very much for your kind words and, and your opening remarks. 
So now it's time to move on and invite our speakers and experts to give their view and share their examples of integration in lesser used languages in many different countries in Europe and also in Canada. First of all, I want to welcome Dr. Vicente Clement Ferrando, who will speak about the case Catalonia. Dr. Clement is research coordinator of the UNESCO Chair on Language Policies for Multilingualism at Universitat Pompeu Fabra Barcelona. He has served as an external policy expert for the European Commission's Asylum, Migration and Integration Fund. He has also been involved in a number of European projects with analysis, which analyzes mobility and inclusion of migrants in today's Europe. The floor is yours, Dr. Vicente Clement Ferranda. Many thanks, Ms. Uh, Gestrin. Uh, many thanks to everybody and thanks to the organizers of Folting It for giving me this opportunity to present my um, research um, here. Um, as as uh, the introducer spoke, I will um, talk about the um, integration in minority languages and more specifically the um, Catalan case. Um, I only have... Uh, we have 15 minutes, so I will go as fast as I can. Um, my presentation has two main goals. One is a general goal to reflect what type of language policies are needed in officially bilingual territories where there is a minority and majority uh, language in a migration scenario. And then I will talk about the Catalan case. That, that will be my specific goal. Uh, the presentation is divided in five parts. So the first uh, will provide a general overview of the language policies for integration of migrants. The second will uh, go straight into the Catalan case. The third, um, I will talk, uh, maybe I will skip it because I think I'll, um, I'll run out of time, of the Catalan legal framework uh, and the contested battle between Spain and Catalonia on that front. Uh, the sec uh, section four will talk, will um, introduce the data that I've gathered in my uh, research. And section five, uh, we'll talk about the concluding remarks and also some lessons to be shared in a wider European context, such as um, this one. Uh, go straight to the part one, to section one. Um, language, as you all know, is an important uh, part of integration. Um, an increasing number of member states of the European states have adopted language requirements, uh, language exams, language courses or language tests uh, for residence permits or nationality. Um, these language exa exams in the vast majority of states are oblig obligatory or compulsory. So this is an increasing trend in all European um, states. As some um, scholars have pointed out, the concept of language competence, comp language competence uh, for belonging to the um, host society has become part of the new citizenship laws and is advocated not only by far-right populist parties, but also by mainstream politicians. Um, so these politics of language um, would not be so much for language in, uh, integration, but for language control, meaning that um, you have to learn the host society language, and if you do not, you're expelled from the country. Uh, we have um, then a conceptual problem. The debates on language for immigrant integration have, of, have often been taking place at a state level. Um, that shouldn't be something to be of a surprise because immigration policies are commonly defined by the state and not by, by lower or sub levels of society. Uh, little attention has been paid at sub-state level and many European regions such as uh, the Basque Country, Alicia, Wales, um, uh, Swedish-speaking territories in Finland, the Balearic Islands, Corsica, Valencia and also Catalonia have a language other than the, than the uh, state language or the majority language. Um, it is very important then to discuss the original language and immigrant integration uh, policies. Why? Because as um, the president of the NPLD just said, um, immigrants tend to adopt the majority language for social mobility and the consequences is are reducing the sub-state population speaking the minority language. Um, for me, uh, something very important to be highlighted here is that any immigrant integration policy should be part of the language policy of a society. So uh, the main goal of many regions is to shape policies also in, um, on immigrant integration. 
Um, I will now talk about the Catalan case. Um, I will highlight two legal measures, uh, the 2010 and 2014 law, which set compulsory uh, Catalan language courses for any immigrant to prove that they have, um, they have been integrated, right? Um, my question here to ponder on or to think about, um, are these uh, compulsory language requirements for Catalan effective? Uh, migrants, okay, they are more exposed to Catalan thanks to those measures. But my question here is, are they more willing to learn and use Catalan thanks to these measures or not? Uh, in other words, what are the real effects of these language measures? I will now turn to the second part, which is the, demogra the demographic data. Um, as you can see here on the screen, uh, around 17% of the population today in Catalonia is foreigner and 21 if we count those who are born um, in a foreign country, but maybe they have some um, Spanish nationality. So Catalonia, as you can see in the graph, uh, grows thanks to immigration, not the local population, but immigration. Um, I will go very fast on these um, graphs. Um, the main nationalities um, are Morocco, about one quarter of a million people living in, 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 in Catalonia, Romania, uh, Italy, China, Pakistan, Colombia, um, Honduras, etc. Which are the languages I'm spoken uh, now other than Catalan and, and Spanish in Catalonia? You can see that almost 800,000 people in Catalonia, around 11-12% of the population, speak a language other than Catalan and Spanish. Um, as you can see here, mainly Arabic, but also Romanian, Tamazic, uh, Galician, uh, Russian, uh, Italian, Chinese, um, German, English, um, Aranese, etc. What about Catalan? Where is it spoken? Um, here you have the graph. This is the map of Catalonia. As you can see here, the 27.5%, those with a light, light blue uh, or whitish light blue, is where, where Barcelona is located. And that's where um, Catalan is less uh, spoken and less and less spoken on a daily basis. It's 27.5%. Uh, those uh, in the outskirts, if you want, of that region, is the place are the places or the regions, the rural uh, areas where Catalan is more um, spoken. So these are the figures of uh, Catalan used as an everyday uh, or habitual language. What about Catalan and Spanish among uh, the foreign population? Here, the yellow, uh, sorry, the orange part of the of the graph is Spanish. So you can see that 99, 98, 95, 92 percent of the population um, are able to understand speak, read, or write um, Spanish. On the other hand, if you can see the blue um, area, it's 80% of the population can understand Catalan, 51% is able to speak it, 64% um, is able to read it, and only 37% um, of the population um, are able to write um, in Catalan, of the foreign population I'm, I'm talking about. I think I'll skip this part because um, I'd like to concentrate more on the data and we'll go straight to the uh, legal framework in Catalonia. I had the legal framework in Spain, but I will um, concentrate um, on, on Catalonia. Um, Catalonia has tried to, to shape its policies on immigrant integration and include language in also in these um, integration measures. As I said before, Two laws or two acts, the 2010 Catalan law and the 2014 uh, decree, which requires uh, by law a 90 hour course, uh, which is mandatory um, for immigrants to have uh, residence permits. There is no exam, there's only attendance of, the, of these uh, courses. Uh, the uh, law always also says that um, it's not only about language, but also a more broader societal uh, knowledge um, of the legal framework of uh, mores and etc. So these are the all the elements that um, are needed for are required for immigrants to have the certificate, the first uh, certificate to prove and to obtain a residence permit in Catalonia. Where can immigrants attend or learn the uh, Catalan? And there are 140 locations uh, throughout Catalonia uh, through a, a public body called Consorci per la Normalizzazio Linguistica, which is a body aimed at providing Catalan courses for them to attend and have this um, certificate. 
Okay, now let's go into the facts and figures. Um, in the latest uh, year, uh, we have this, uh, take a look at the um, yellow part, uh, the initial and basic courses, which, is the, which are the courses that uh, immigrants are required to take if they want to apply for residence permits. Um, my question here when I saw these figures uh, was, why are there so many people registered at the beginner's initial course, which is the yellow um, uh, part of the, of the um, graph? And why do figures drop uh, exponentially uh, uh, after that? So the elementally, uh, elementary, intermediate, and the more um, advanced uh, courses. So, so wh wh why is this? The same figures in another uh, put in another way. Uh, more and more people are taking the initial and basic, and less people are taking the elementary, intermediate, and um, more uh, elaborate courses. In this is this, these are the same figures, but um, in percentages. I will move on. Um, so um, I realized that there was there was a need to do research to understand the real effects of the legal requirements. Are they are these legal Catalan requirements an effective way to learn and to become um, part of the Catalan society? So far, I've shown quantitative data, but what about the qualitative data? What about um, asking why not asking immigrants why they take these language courses and they stop taking them after the basic courses which is um, that they are required to have this uh, permit uh, granted. I gathered a sample of 23 students of those courses and also four teachers. Um, the sample was intended to be wider but due to the pandemic situation the results must be taken as a preliminary. And these are the main results uh, that I gathered um, for the uh, on the reasons of for dropping language courses after the mandatory or the elementary courses. Uh, the first uh, is that um, they all or practically all said that they, their main interest was for legal reasons. They needed a certificate, so that's why they were attending uh, the beginners um, language courses. Also, they claimed that the schedule was not compatible to move on to do other courses. Um, the third element that was important was that the basic compulsory courses are free, so not, but not the rest. So that's, what, that's why they didn't take um, any other course. And also something that was very striking and which is something that we should uh, take into account is that Catalan, they claim that Catalan is not needed in daily life for them work, friends, and family. So there was also a lack of motivation uh, on, on Catalan. As you could see before on the, on the map, um, you know, here, uh, Catalan is not spoken on a daily basis everywhere in Catalonia. So you can see that where more people are concentrated, which is Barcelona and the metropolitan area in Barcelona, is precisely where Catalan is less present, only 27% and 38%. So that's why that explains why they claimed that um, um, Catalan um, is not perceived as, some, as a language that's needed for the, in, a daily, in daily life. I've put also here some teachers' voices, um, which I will summarize very fast. Um, um, they all claimed that um, it's not enough. 90-hour uh, requirement is not enough. Um, they all go for the certificate, but they all claim that um, they do not have a context uh, where they can hear and speak and practice Catalan outside this uh, mandatory academic context. So uh, the situation in Catalan is far, for, in Catalonia is far from being uh, normalized, they say. Uh, another teacher also um, said that uh, 90 hours is not enough. In other European states, uh, these requirements are between 400 and 700 hours. And also another element that um, is that um, they do not need to take any exam. They just need to uh, attend to assist and to be uh, uh, present at the course. So nothing else. So you're there. You don't have to take any exam. So you have four and 90 hours and then you have the uh, exam. Um, Another preliminary result, I'm finishing already um, a couple of minutes, um, is uh, another research that, um, in the same direction. And uh, uh, the conclusions are a bit the same. The beginners, many and many people, uh, take language test only for the certificate, nothing else. Um, just as a concluding remark, I have more questions than answers. Uh, uh, my question here that in a bilingual uh, situation, such as in a minority majority situation, uh, 
are compulsory language requirements effective in a minoritized uh, uh, language context? The data indicates that it's not as straightforward as one might think. Um, uh, it's not a guarantee. Compulsory uh, language courses are not guarantee of linguistic integration of migrants because uh, the results show that participation is primarily uh, taking place in Spanish. Uh, in order for a language to be used, there has to be a need. Remember the map that I showed you uh, before. The need in Catalan is very, very low compared to the, the comparing that those into those um, figures. And just take into account that the majority of the population is located in the metropolitan area of Barcelona, which happens to be the area where less Catalan is um, spoken. And just to finalize the recommendation, um, Catalan, and not only Catalan, but any minority language uh, needs to be linked to progress. I needed to get a job, to a better job. I needed to make new friends. I needed to join the local chess club, for example. And in some, I need it because I want to be part of the new society. So if we switch into the majority language, in our, in our case, to Spanish, uh, these ideas are not perceived. Um, in some language policy in a minoritized context is also the politics, the politics of empathy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, your most interesting presentation. And now we will move on to the case Wales and our next speaker, namely senior lecturer Gwenna Hayam who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Welsh, Swansea University in, Sway in Wales. Her research is in the field of international migration and the Welsh language with a focus on issues related to integration, belonging and multicultural citizenship. Of special interest for us in Finland is that uh, she uh, will also carry out research on uh, migrant uh, integration through the Swedish language in Finland and in turn compared this to the Welsh case. The floor is yours. Yeah, <clears throat> Tag uh, Kitos, thank you very much for the invitation. It really is a privilege uh, to be with you here. So I'll just take my glasses off. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm very impressed by the previous presentation and I hope I can also offer some insight um, from my own uh, more research, social linguistic perspective. Um, so I hope to give you an overview of very briefly the Welsh language situation, migration in Wales, um, and then particularly looking at research which has been focused on developing a provision of Welsh for international migrants, and also looking more at um, qualitative data on mi migrants' uh, perceptions and reactions to these um, classes. So for those who don't know, um, Wales, like Catalonia, is a sub-state, um, and we are a devolved, we are recognised as a devolved government, uh, where we have official bilingualism. Um, and uh, according to the latest census data, which was well, 10 years ago now. Um, so 19% of the population speak Welsh, um, which has declined slightly from the previous census data. So even though um, Welsh has been celebrated for its efforts to revitalize, um, there is obviously continued concern. Uh, as you can see from the map, like Catalonia, um, there's quite a disparity between those who speak Welsh, mainly uh, the red, areas are the rural Welsh speaking areas um, and the greeny colours and the lighter colours are um, obviously with the languages less spoken and the more populated areas and those of course are where migrants are mostly, international migrants are mostly uh, residing. Um, nevertheless uh, what is interesting in Wales of course is when we talk about migration we are talking about internal as well as external mi um, um, migration. So there are many, in fact, over a third of Wales's population is born outside of Wales, but many of those, of course, are migrants from England, Scotland, um, settling in Wales. So there are two, um, two factors at play in Wales. Um, and in terms of the Welsh language, uh, it's in a very precarious position, although the Welsh government, as you can see here, um, is aiming to reach a million Welsh speakers uh, by 2015. 
Uh, so just a few brief facts then on migration. In terms of international migration, uh, the latest data, which is also outdated, um, is around 6.4% of the population um, are from outside the UK. Uh, this is very much likely to increase with the next census data. It is important to note to say that international migration is on the increase and the future of Wales' population does depend on migration. Its effect on the Welsh language, well, it has been considered one of the biggest factors contributing to the decline. That includes, of course, internal and external migration. Um, I mean, what is increasingly interesting and obvious in Wales and in the UK are different um, ideologies at play. Um, while, of course, we're aware since Brexit, um, there is very much a hostility towards um, others, uh, especially um, international migrants. Uh, and there is a particular policy um, to uh, detract, <laughs> deter um, migrants from settling in the UK. Uh, that's called the hostile environment policy. Um, obviously, on the other side in Wales, um, possibly in reaction to this uh, with a different government, uh, there is a, um, a desire to portray Wales as a very welcoming nature. And there is um, a Welsh government strategy called Nation of Sanctuary um, in order to improve uh, the conditions and lives of migrants in Wales. However, um, Wales does not have any uh, voice on who uh, comes to Wales in terms of refugees and asylum seekers, but they do have certain powers, for example, over education, Welsh language, of course, and also the area of social cohesion. Um, so trying to make people's lives easier, better in any way that's possible. Um, so just to move on then, uh, more to my area of research, which looks at adult language provision in Wales. Um, and what we have is two main institutions, one which provides English language and the other which provides Welsh language. Uh, and they are very much, uh, have been separate entities um, so the English, which is called ESOL, English for Speakers of Other Languages, um, really is uh, based in the UK um, ideology of English, one language, one nation, um, you must learn English in order to progress, etc. Um, even though it is in the power of the Welsh Government, it generally has that main purpose and ideology. Um, and even though there is research on promoting multilingualism of ESOL students, um, English is the dominant language provided. Welsh provision, on the other hand, is quite different. It is aimed at, um, well, UK citizens mainly, um, those in Wales who don't speak Welsh, and of course anybody else as well, but it is really aimed at a middle class audience the difference between them, one of them key difference is in ESOL on the whole is free of charge and you do have to pay for Welsh language provision. Um, so they do target different groups, different audiences and not really had much to do with each other <laughs> until recently, uh, until I started my research. Uh, before I move on to talk about my research, I uh, just wanted to bring your attention to a European project that I was part of looking at the benefits of bilingual education for international migrants, especially those who want to uh, have jobs uh, in healthcare particularly. Uh, and Finland, as you can see, was also a part of the project. So if, you're, if this is of interest, please look at the, the website and there are many recommendations here. I just wanted to highlight one particular one because I know um, in the summary of this event, it, well, the question was which language <laughs> is useful for um, migrants to learn. And uh, certainly from our research, the idea is that actually it's not a case about which language, uh, it's about the opportunity to have both uh, the dominant and minority language uh, and education in these both languages to be available to, um, to all uh, migrants. However, um, my own research, which um, interviewed many uh, language teachers, including the English and the Welsh teachers, also government um, policymakers in Wales, as well as migrants, 
um, this monolingual ideology was very much present and you can see from the extracts that I have here. Uh, so these are from the English teachers uh, and they, they do reflect, uh, to be honest, uh, general attitudes of the government office, officers in Wales I interviewed that basically you do need to choose <laughs> between one and the other. And obviously English is the dominant language. Uh, it's, it's considered the language of progress, the language of cohesion uh, and co some comments on Welsh not being useful. Um, and yeah, obviously English is the obvious one. Sorry about that. Uh, this was also reflected in a Welsh government policy. So it's first ESOL policy in 2014, uh, where they described ESOL in Wales as an additional challenge. Why? Because there are two languages uh, and Welsh bilingual signs, for example, can be, well, uh, difficult to understand uh, because English is already different to them. Uh, so this is kind of the context that I've been working in. Uh, and I was interested to think about this and wonder, well, what do migrants think themselves? I mean, these are, to what extent is this based on any background research? This is a general ideology attitude that is um, employed and used by people. Um, so I was very pleased to be uh, um, the first person to establish Welsh classes for migrants as part of my research. Um, and I tried to do it in a, in a very flexible, adaptable approach. I did actually go to Quebec and look at what was done there, the francisation classes there. So partly it was inspired by what, what was happening in Quebec. Uh, but I soon realised that um, teaching Welsh to international migrants was very different to the idea of teaching English. Um, and one of the things they found was by introducing Welsh, which is a non-dominant language, opened a platform to um, talk about a variety of subjects and areas which maybe wouldn't have been so possible with English. Uh, and there is research that has been taking place on the fact that taking a non-dominant language can enable um, migrants to be more free to talk about areas, talk about their own personal uh, difficulties, struggles, of course their own multilingual backgrounds, but even um, partly their own personal experiences of trauma. And this is what I found in fact that it really opened uh, a door to lots of different pathways and it really became much more than simply teaching a language. It was really taking the whole person um, and of course, my role was more of a mediator. Um, and um, yeah, the other thing that was interesting is that while ESOL English was tied very much to um, what they had to do for citizenship uh, or for exam requirements, uh, there was some sort of release um, and a bit more freedom with Welsh. And I did observe that empowered many of the students um, to have a voice. Uh, and also feeling um, um, of empowerment to be able to contribute to Welsh language revitalization efforts. Many, of course, such as Kurdish people um, who could very much relate to the situation in Wales. Right. Sorry, just yeah. Um, the other interesting thing very quickly is that while working with the English provision, um, an extra uh, well, bonus as far as I'm concerned, uh, was that I was able to challenge some of these monolingual ideologies amongst the teachers. Um, and through taking part in these uh, classes, some of the teachers' attitudes actually changed and realised, <laughs> um, you know, that it is possible to learn more than one language. You don't have to fit into set boxes, etc. And, and I think uh, working together, as far as I'm concerned, in the Welsh case, um, has a lot of positive uh, benefits. As a result of my research, and um, some years have gone by, so the Welsh uh, provision for adults has now developed a particular course targeting international migrants. It is free of charge, I believe, um, mainly for refugees and asylum seekers, uh, it's only been established since 2019, so we're very different to the situation in Catalonia. However, there are groups all over Wales now uh, of migrants who have been learning through this course. Um, 
in both the um, cities uh, in the south as well as more rural Welsh speaking areas. Um, and also they have been reaching, reaching out to the English provision and training um, English teachers to use this course. Um, so it's really been based in more of a community led approach rather than from the government. Uh, and also, as you can see, maybe from the different languages there, the idea of multilingualism has been ingrained as part of an important part of the course. Um, so my time is going, so I thought I might just turn quickly to some reflections of some people who have taken these courses, uh, who have only been here uh, for a, a number of years and obviously just taking up these learning well since about 2019. So I just refer first to one person here just to see what what are their reactions to learning Welsh? I just move on the day. If I can speak more language or different language, it's getting more opportunity, jobs. Yes, I appreciate uh, I having opportunity to learn Welsh because, uh, because um, it's just like uh, uh, giving me more skill, like learning new skill. Right, and then on to Joseph. Green Timlo, at a poet, at a poet, of course. Well, um, I love Camdesa Seriais, Sin Helpigariais, Shai Smaur, of my people and Guerf Paurogi, best wedi. Uh, so about that. So there's just very briefly <laughs> some reactions. Um, so there has been a drive to uh, to give Welsh classes to refugees, um, and has been integrated, as I said, in some of the mainstream English um, provision. So I realise my time is more or less up. So just to present you some of the benefits, um, I might not be able to name them all. Uh, but certainly Welsh classes have enriched integration cohesion and I would argue improves well-being of migrants. Um, have, there is a niche there for Welsh language revitalization which maybe isn't emphasized enough in policy. There have been challenges definitely since the pandemic and there is a need now for a more one-to-one -one approach and I'm working on language partnership schemes, befriending schemes, there is no Welsh policy for migrants in Wales, and that's something to consider in the future. However, how effective would that be? And is a more community-led approach more effective in the end? So, Diochan Bawr, thank you. Thank you very much for your, your presentation. It was really interesting. And from Wales, we will move on to Canada and to Director General Alain Dubois, Federation, Federation des Communautés Acadiennes et Francophones. His organization is a national organization representing French speaking communities living in nine provinces and three territories in Canada. Since the year 2000, the organization has been very active in the area of immigration and has made French language immigration a collective and national priority in support of the development and enhancement of Acadian and Francophone communities in Canada. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much and thank you for this invitation. It is still quite early here in Canada, so bear with me if I am looking for my words. French uh, is my first language, so uh, and I'm used to speaking about this subject in uh, my native tongue. So uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for the invitation and uh, bravo to uh, the previous presentations. Uh, they were very, they were excellent. Um, so uh, just to, to start off, my organization represents uh, 2.7 million people who speak French outside of Quebec. Quebec is the majority, French is the majority language in the province of Quebec in Canada, whereas English is the majority language in the rest of the country. And the, in the rest of the country, that those are the provinces and territories where uh, our organization represents Francophones. Um, so Canada is obviously 
a very big country uh, territorially. And as you see uh, on this map that I'm showing, uh, Quebec is where there are about uh, 7 million uh, Francophones uh, that, uh, that live in Quebec and that speak French. French is the common uh, language in Quebec. Uh, there is an important uh, English minority in Quebec. But today I'm going to be speaking to you about the other green dots on this uh, map that are Francophone and Acadian communities in a minority setting. And most of these communities are not uh, majority communities. So if you look, I'm from Northern Ontario um, and my community Sudbury is about 30% French speaking, 70% English speaking. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about immigration, but in a, a doubly uh, minority situation. Um, I feel like the presentations uh, that, uh, that came before me were um, probably more representative of what uh, the experience is in Quebec, where newcomers, uh, even if they don't speak French, will learn French uh, to integrate into, uh, into society, whereas in our communities, we mostly um, uh, welcome people that already speak French from la francophonie, from different countries in obviously Europe, Northern Africa and, and Sub-Saharan Africa and a bit uh, from Asia also. Um, but we, our communities mostly uh, integrate people who already have the language, uh, which might uh, be an advantage uh, at, at some level. Um, but there are also uh, some some difficulties for the for those newcomers to uh, adapt to that bilingual setting where English is uh, still very much required. Um, and our minority communities, francophone communities outside of Quebec, they are very different. There are some communities where it's a very rural context where they are majority French speaking, uh, whereas a city as where I am right now, Ottawa, where we're the national capital, we are about 15% uh, French speakers in this capital. So uh, obviously English is still very important. Um, if uh, For our communities, for our Francophone communities, we've been established uh, across the country for generations. Uh, uh, most of our communities were settled uh, in the 1800s uh, by Quebecers that moved west, uh, if you will. The case of Atlantic Canada is a little bit different, where the French uh, settled uh, in the 1600s and developed uh, and colonized that area first, then moved on to Quebec and then uh, pursued uh, uh, colonization uh, to from the west uh, western provinces, but uh, for our communities uh, that are from originally from from uh, from Canada, immigration became a priority for us for our survival um, for the survival of French outside of Quebec in the early two thousands. Uh, so my organization worked with the government of Canada. Uh, to change the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, the National Act, to make sure that Canada as a whole uh, would have an objective not only to uh, integrate um, newcomers in French in Quebec, but to also have an objective uh, to welcome people in French across the country, even in a minority setting. Um, so as of 2003, the Canadian federal government set a target of 4% of French-speaking immigrants outside of Quebec um, to settle in our Francophone minority communities. Unfortunately, that target has never been uh, um, reached since 2003. We're about, uh, we're about a 3% Francophone immigration. Um, so what has happened is that our, the demographic weight of our French-speaking communities outside of Quebec have, uh, un has unfortunately uh, been, been uh, shrinking as well. So for us, it's a very important issue to make sure that for our future development and uh, frankly, our uh, existence as minority communities is very important that the government of Canada does more to attract and promote uh, our Francophone and bilingual communities across the country. Um, I will say the, the difficulty for us as a minority community is that we don't have uh, 
uh, very much control over government policy, seeing as we are minorities in every government level across the country, provincial, federal, and municipal. Um, our communities don't have a government that can, you know, put forward policies very easily that will favor our francophone minorities. Uh, so we have to do a lot of political lobbying to, to be heard uh, at all levels of government, uh, which takes time. And obviously, uh, we, we are always uh, informing why it's important to add French as a requirement for uh, a, a percentage of, uh, of newcomers that come uh, settle uh, in, in outside of Quebec. Um, and the importance of that is that for us, our linguistic rights as Francophones often depend on the percentage of the population we represent. So we will only have access to government services if, for example, we are more than 5% of the uh, overall population. So for us as a as a welcoming uh, community, uh, it's, it's very important that we keep uh, um, we keep uh, receiving newcomers in our communities. Um, but there are uh, many challenges to uh, integrating in a francophone or a bilingual setting. Um, and the first is that uh, an immigrant needs to learn both official languages to succeed in our communities. Um, because basically, uh, there are very few jobs that require French only uh, outside of Quebec. And we do get newcomers that only speak French. And unfortunately uh, for them, they must learn English to succeed and to get a job. Um, unless they want to work in French language schools or daycares or services to the Francophone minority. So that's basically a, a, a double challenge. You must, you must have both languages to succeed in, our, uh, in a minority setting. Um, if I, I'm just going to go a little. So the settlement experience uh, within a Francophone community is very different and requires also a different approach. Um, for us, it's very important that the immigrant, the French speaking immigrant is, um, is, uh, has services in French from the day they, they, they get to Canada. Because uh, for us, uh, we've heard stories and, and it's, a, it's a tendency that if the newcomer that is a French speaking uh, has only access to English services when they get to Canada, uh, they will not necessarily discover our community. And we've heard many, many stories about uh, Francophone immigrants that settle in one of our provinces and learns four or five years later that there's a French minority community and that there's a French language school that they could have sent their kids to. Um, and, and so for us, it's very important to develop a pathway of French language services for newcomers uh, from the day they get uh, to Canada all the way uh, till, till they get to sit their citizenship uh, in our country. Um, the other important thing is that French language services not only gives you that connection with the Francophone community, but it is a better service because it is a service that speaks your language, that knows uh, the, the diversity of your of la francophonie internationale of international francophone uh, populations, uh, and and it's a it's a service that we want tailored to the specificities of the French speaking immigrant. Uh, Canada has also developed pre departure services, and I think that that's quite uh, unique uh, for um, as a country. We now offer services before the newcomer even arrives in Canada. Uh, where we will uh, try and put them uh, in a school and, and, and take into account the needs of the whole family. Um, and that has also been good because we are now are able to speak to newcomers even before uh, they arrive in Canada uh, to make sure that they know uh, that Francophone communities exist. And we developed a new, uh, new service at Toronto Pearson Airport, which is the biggest airport in Canada where we now have uh, direct contact with Francophone immigrants when they get to the airport to already tell them, uh, talk to them about uh, how you can live in French in our different communities across the country.
Um, I think that there are a lot of uh, possibilities uh, and best practices that exist uh, for, for, for newcomers. Um, I think that because we ourselves as Francophones in Canada are a minority, we have a sense of uh, inclusion that is probably much different than uh, the Anglophone community in Canada. Um, and there's a shared type of struggle there. We uh, obviously as Fr French speakers are always make and want to make sure that our language is uh, protected and promoted in Canada. And I think that uh, that for, for some newcomers, that's that's very um, that's a, it's a shared struggle that that they can integrate and, and become also a part of that uh, objective to make sure that our communities and the French language, still survives um, throughout, uh, throughout for, for the future generations. Um, that being said, for me personally, French is a beautiful language and I'm very proud of that heritage, but for Francophone newcomers that come from French can also be a colonial language um, that, uh, that specifically for uh, for for african immigrants um it can they don't always have that same uh connection to the french language um and as we heard english is uh is very attractive um for them because it is seen as the language uh, in which there are more job opportunities and um some some francophone immigrants that that come to our communities um also decide not to speak french or not to uh, give French, pass on French to their uh, to their children and to their families. So we also see that assimilation that can exist more rapidly uh, for Francophone newcomers in a minority setting. Um, but for us, what is important uh, as a Francophone community is developing that sense of community based on a shared language and multiple cultures. So I think in our context, there's not necessarily a desire to make sure that everybody has the same cultural background or that, that melting pot uh, vision that, that, that some countries may have. Uh, for us, uh, in our schools, we see very multicultural uh, backgrounds. And the thing that does unite us is that shared language. And also, uh, our objective is always to make sure that our communities are more welcoming um, and that immigrants find their place, uh, that can, they can become teachers, they can become uh, leaders in our different uh, community organizations. And for that, we must continually be promoting um, inclusion and diversity. And we have a, a many, many different uh, initiatives like Francophone Immigration Week, where every year there are about 250 activities across the country to make sure that uh, we celebrate Francophone immigrants. Um, and that has been uh, a great initiative from the FCFA that's been uh, promoted also by our governments. We also designated 14 welcoming Francophone communities where the government and our organization have partnered to make sure that there are projects to bring together the host communities and Francophone immigrants. Um, and also we offer forums to discuss systemic racism and discrimination to make sure that our communities are always evolving in their uh, desire to learn and to be welcoming uh, for all. And that is a very important thing to do, not only uh, one or two times, but on a continual basis because uh, inclusion is not something necessarily that that is always natural and um, and, and given in a given so uh, so in conclusion uh, making francophone immigration a success requires working on two poles the host community uh, and the immigrant experience to make sure they get the the services in the language of their choice um, but immigrant inclusion and retention also requires open-minded communities that are mobilized to this end. And we've been doing that with our many different groups across the country to offer jobs, schools, and civic participation opportunities. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, I was in the time and uh, I, I am uh, open to questions a bit later on. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much much, uh, Alain, for sharing this morning hour with, with us. Uh, 
And after the Canadian example, we come back to Finland. Researcher Pasi Saukkonen and ministerial advisor Anna Brun uh, will now comment from a Finnish perspective. And Dr. Pasi Saukkonen is uh, a, a political scientist who is currently working at the city of Helsinki Executive Office, Urban Research and Statistics Unit. His expertise is in nationalism and national identity, language policy, integration policy, cultural policy and politics in a multicultural society. He has been a member of the Finnish Advisory Board on Language Affairs and Finnish National Commission for UNESCO. And uh, I uh, introduce Anna also now at the same time. Anna Brun is uh, working at the Labour Migration and Integration Unit uh, at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment in Finland. And she is working with questions uh, relating to diversity and integration, the integration of vulnerable groups as well as integration in Swedish. Please, the floor is yours. Shall I start, Anna? Or do you want to start? Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairperson, and very great thanks to, to all the three presentations uh, that we just heard. It's, it's always very nice to learn new things, and I'm uh, sure that Finland, Finnish society as a whole, also got a lot of lessons that we have to. to think carefully uh, uh, about and, and try to apply uh, what is applicable and, and, and valuable. It's also always very nice to, to uh, hear this kind of cases, uh, country cases in a row, because you start observing similarities and differences between countries, which uh, always uh, are, are there. And, and this was also the case that in, in, on the one hand, in all three uh, presentations, uh, similar kinds of questions were, were discussed, but also all the settings were, were quite different from each other. As you uh, might know, uh, Finland from a language policy perspective is a quite a peculiar case. Um, because the country is um, officially uh, bilingual to national language, languages without the country being a federal state or having any other kind of regional linguistic autonomous uh, uh, arrangements with the exception of the Orland uh, Islands. And th this is quite... Uh, now, not so common in, in, in the Western countries, at, at least. And it uh, brings along some, some questions also with regard to in what language uh, immigrants should integrate into to Finland. Um, I very much agree with uh, Vicente said. I'll generalize his uh, point a little bit. Um, repeating that, that learning languages must always be linked to progress in order to language policies, language teaching uh, arrangements to be really uh, productive, efficient. There must be a, a, a positive immigrant experience, as, as Alain put it. And, and the thing in Finland means that we, we really have to think quite carefully what this progress means in the Finnish case, because it might be a little bit different than in other, other places. One thing was what uh, Sandra Bariquist said uh, in, in the beginning, is that for, for many uh, immigrants into Finland, no doubt, not, not always, but in many cases, Swedish might very well be the easier language to learn uh, compared with Finnish language to, to, to start with. That not only those who, who have uh, Germanic language as a mother tongue, but uh, lots of immigrants also 
know at least already English or German or some other Scandinavian languages and then learning Swedish is definitely easier than, than learning Finnish. Then on the other side there is the fact that the Finnish is the predominant language of the country, that there is no bigger municipality, no big city uh, where uh, Swedish would be in a majority position, that, that Finnish is a majority language everywhere with the exception of some smaller communities. And I would very strongly recommend all those who come to stay here for, for good to also learn Finnish because otherwise you, you uh, limit your own opportunities and possibilities quite, quite much uh, because there are so few jobs where you can get along only with Swedish only. But then there is the third thing, and that this is uh, related with fin Finland as a whole being an officially bilingual country, that, that if you really want to have a large range of opportunities, there are lots of jobs, especially in, in officially uh, bilingual communities, but also in the whole of Finland, where not only Finnish language, but also Swedish language is, is required. So in a, in a way, in order to, to integrate into Finnish um, society comprehensively, uh, uh, understood as having as large a range of opportunities as possible, you really should also learn both languages, Finnish and, and, and Swedish. And, and I think that that's, not a, that's a message that we should give, but it's also something that we have to work with. And I heard very, very interesting from Gwen, both Gwen and, and, and Elaine and, and, and Vicente that how could you uh, assist, how could you, you uh, have that kind of institutions and instruments with which not only one language can be taught, but, but two languages. But I don't have more time at my disposal, so Anna, I will uh, give the floor to you. Thank you, Pasi, and thank you, all speakers. Uh, it's been a very interesting few hours to hear about the different uh, uh, models used in each country. And just as Pasi, I was actually quite much thinking about the differences and, and similarities between uh, all speakers we've heard today. Um, I reflected upon uh, what uh, quite many of you told um, that uh, seeing integration uh, in a minority language as a way to support actually integration into a local community. So I think this is a, a very strong positive message uh, that I hear today. Choosing a, a minority language can actually be a good way uh, of integrating into a local community. Uh, Alain Depuis uh, mentioned uh, the importance of policies of uh, inclusion and welcoming society to actually support uh, this kind of uh, uh, integrating into the local community. And I think this is something that we talk more and more about also uh, in Finland uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, it was very interesting what uh, Gwen and Haim mentioned uh, about uh, uh, what what kind of results she saw uh, when uh, students were uh, studying Welsh, uh, which is a non-dominant language, and how it made it possible for them to actually reflect on more personal aspects of life, and 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 in that way also increase their well-being. I think this is a good example uh, of how studying uh, a minority language also um, supports uh, the actual uh, inclusion into society. But I could also hear that there are uh, quite many sort of contextual or, or legal differences uh, between the countries. Um, one being uh, the, the national sort of will to actually recognize the linguistic diversity existing in the country. Uh, in some countries, integration in different languages is being part of the common language policy. In other countries, it is not. Um, in the Finnish case, as Pasi mentioned, we do have uh, possibilities to integrate either in Finnish or in Swedish. And it is a question of, of individual, individual choice, which language you actually uh, choose. Um, 
it was interesting to hear uh, Vincent uh, Clement uh, mentioning how in Catalan case actually compulsory language training will have negative uh, 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 results on on the actual uh, learning of the of the language it makes students sometimes unmotivated uh, and challenges the possibilities to learn the language that was an interesting example uh, but as i said the finnish case in uh, is somewhat uh, different because we do have the possibility for students to make individual choices um, because I'm running out of time, I will stop here. But uh, once again, uh, I would like to thank also the uh, the Swedish Assembly for organizing this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pasi Saukonen and uh, Anna Bruun for your for your comments. And now uh, I want to ask if uh, any one of the the speakers would like to, to comment on something or ask uh, a question to, to, to someone else here, uh, someone, someone of the speakers. Uh, we could have time for one or two comments. Uh, you can just take the, open your, your Alan. Please. Yes, um, I was very interested uh, by uh, Vincent uh, from the case from Catalonia. I just wanted to see if he could comment a bit more about the citizenship test or uh, certificate that was offered or that, that was required by the local government and maybe to the other, uh, to the other um, participants also is uh, here in Canada, for example, Quebec, where French is the minor, majority language, uh, there isn't a specific test for the French-speaking province uh, that is required from immigrants. It's the same national test for all Canadian, uh, uh, for, for, for all people coming to Canada. So I'm interested in seeing, are there other examples? And maybe if, uh, if uh, Vincent can talk a little bit more about that, uh, of specific uh, citizenship certificates or tests that are adapted to the minority language context. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, would uh, Dr. Vicent Clement want to to could could you comment on this question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much um, for the for the um, uh, question, um, Alain. Uh, um, to my knowledge, and I've done a comparative research in Europe, um, um, Catalonia is the first and the only uh, region at sub-state level that has compulsory uh, language requirements. Um, so there is by law that any immigrant uh, must uh, learn or attend, as I said before, a, langu a, a Catalan language course for uh, to prove that they are willing to integrate, right? Um, I also know that you will probably know more than I do that um, Quebec, because of um, it's the only place um, I would say in the Western world that I know of that has also exclusive competence on uh, immigration. So they they can also have. Um, immigrants from uh, French-speaking territories, um, they can also select uh, migrants. Um, so that's something that we cannot do uh, here in any uh, sub-state level um, in Europe, not Catalonia, Basque Country, or any other region in, in Europe. So, so far, I would say that Catalonia is the only place uh, at a sub-state level, I'd like to uh, highlight the sub-state level that um, has this compulsory, again, the word uh, compulsory is important, um, integration, language integration uh, measures. But I said before, um, they're not really um, actually effective because they you only require uh, to attend, not an exam, or um, it's only ninety hour a ninety hour course. So um, okay, it's it's one step, but it's just symbolic rather than something else. And uh, many uh, migrants um, kind of feel like they are obliged to learn a language that um not pe they cannot they do not hear on the street because they usually not only but usually live in Barcelona or the metropolitan area 
in, in Barcelona. When you go to the regions, to the small villages, then that's something else, that's a, another story. They actually integrate through Catalan because it's language spoken there, but the majority of the people live in Barcelona or the uh, metropolitan area. Thank you. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, time is, is running and, and, and I think we have to, to continue with the program. Uh, and uh, now it's time for me to invite the last speaker of the day. And she is Claudine uh, Broy. Uh, she's a Swiss member of the Committee of Experts of the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages and Senior Lecturer at the University of Freiburg. Her research areas are language, contacts in multilingual areas, integration of individual and official by multilingualism and multilingual education. And uh, Claudine will now sum up the discussion about what, of, of what we have heard today. And uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see me and hear me? Yes. Okay. We can. Yeah, very well. Thank you so much to Folk Tinget for the organization of this webinar, which is very timely uh, because uh, we have in our title benefits and challenges. And of course, we have a lot of challenges. We have a double challenge because there is a challenge uh, where we have bilingual and multilingual areas and migration is a challenge. So we have, so to say, uh, uh, a double ch a challenge with uh, um, the uh, topic you have chosen. Uh, uh, it was so interesting to uh, listen to these case studies. Uh, we had Catalonia, Wales and Canada and also Finland. And uh, I think it is so interesting to hear about multilingual regions. I always said I'm happy to live in a multilingual region and uh, I would continue to live in one because it's so interesting and diverse and dynamic. I'm not going to summarize each individual uh, presentation. All of them were very, very interesting. We have very different political systems. Uh, we have federal, a federal system, a regional system, a centralized system. I myself from a very federal state. Then the status of the minority languages presented are very, very diverse. If we considered the numbers of speakers, uh, the political status, the help. Uh, the minority gets from the central government. So the status of these different languages is, is very, very uh, diverse. Uh, we have heard some very interesting uh, uh, ideas. Um, minority languages should be attractive. I think this is very important. Uh, we have to be attracted by these uh, minority languages because uh, attraction and empathy and uh, uh, feelings, uh, that's the motor of our acts. And I think we learn better when we are motivated. It has been said too that there has to be a need and need creates motivation. Um, then what we heard too is that migration can be a threat to minority languages, but also a chance for minority languages, but we need a, a language policy for that. So a language policy in a multilingual area is not only on the national or regional language, but also uh, it should also encompass the migrant languages, which is very important in these countries uh, which uh, face uh, migration and it's not going to stop. I know that this is a process uh, which uh, will even uh, get uh, more and more important. Um, 
we have uh, to recognize that linguistic integration has to take place in both the majority and minority language. Uh, why should the migrants be uh, not so well off as the local population? Uh, they want to be bilingual, they have to be bilingual. So when you migrate, maybe you have to learn both languages. And somebody spoke about the monolingual ideology. We know all about this monolingual ideology. And now we have to go further than the bilingual ideology. Uh, we have to consider multilingualism as the norm. And as somebody says that the migrants very often have a multilingual experience. They don't have a monolingual experience. Uh, they don't have a bilingual experience. Very often they have a multilingual experience. They speak different dialects, which are not recognized, for instance. Um, what is interesting too in the case of English is that English, in the case of Canada, uh, it's an official national language, but English is not only a mother tongue, it's a lingua franca, it's a second language, it's a foreign language, and there are far more people who speak English as a second or foreign language than as a first or as a, a mother tongue, as we say. Uh, what was very um, uh, positive, I think, were the contacts of uh, Wales with Quebec Francization classes. And this is very good. That's what we are doing now. I think networking is very important. That's what we do. So maybe we should keep in touch and uh, uh, rephrase the, the good practices and share them. Although we know that our areas are so different and the minority languages are so different. Um, then what is very important is, and it was, uh, um, it was said also, is the need for information, for good information for everybody. Information and communication. We have to inform and communicate that we have minority language languages, that we have to learn them for economical, cultural, social reasons, for inclusion, for awareness rising. That's very, very important. And not only years after the migrants are here, but before they come, or right when they come, as this was uh, uh, said in the Canadian uh, context. Um, uh, we know that the migrants can back and support the revitalizing process. And this is very important because it gives them also responsibility to be part of this revitalizing process uh, for smaller languages. Uh, that's very important. Um, then we heard that sometimes the minority language is easier to learn than the majority language, like in the case of uh, Finland. Uh, I have to say, yes, in my case, I understand a lot more of Swedish than, than Finnish with uh, German and, and uh, English. And I have the Swiss case with the Romansh as a very small language with 40,000 speakers. And we have a very important Portuguese immigrant in Switzerland and in the Graubünden, the region, uh, the Portuguese speakers back the revitalization of the Romansh language, which is uh, very important. Um, then we have seen that uh, we have a state policy, but we need maybe a lower level um, of uh, uh, offers for language courses, for projects, as we have seen in Wales, uh, sometimes the national level is too far away from us. We need to have community projects. They are maybe more efficient uh, than the other, uh, the, the, the big uh, projects which come from the states uh, and when nobody's fully responsible for the implementation and of measuring, of course, the efficiency. Uh, we have projects, we have a policy, and of course, we have to measure the effects, the efficiency of our policies. So uh, that was my time, which was given to me. So once again, thank you so much uh, for these presentations. Thank you very much, uh, Claudine Broye, for your for summing up the discussion here today, and thank you for your your wise words. And uh, let me also just conclude by by uh, by saying that that I think that this webinar has showed us that there is a lot we can learn from each other, and that the discussion must continue. And I'm sorry that we couldn't now. 
uh, answer all the, the questions here in the, the chat that we didn't ha have time for that this time. And uh, on behalf of Folktinge, I once again uh, want to express my gratitude to all the speakers and uh, all of you participants here today. This uh, discussion, this webinar will be published later uh, on the channels of Folkting, so you can, can watch this later on and listen to the discussion later on. And uh, well, finally, uh, thank you uh, for being here with us today. And uh, I wish, wish you a, a, a good day in, in Canada and a, a nice evening here in, in Europe. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. A pleasure. Bye bye, everybody. Tak. Yeah. Hi, Colin. Hello, who's talking to me? It's me, Claudine. Oh, hello there. Good to see you. How are you? <laughs> Fine. How are you since yeah. uh, we met in, um, in Strasbourg? <laughs> Hi. Here. Here I am. Right. I've just put my, just put my video on. Will they let us still speak for a while? Okay. Yes. 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 Here I am. <laughs> Claudine from Switzerland. <laughs> good. We met in Strasbourg. Yes. 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 Are you well? Talking about the charter. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm just trying to finish a book for Cambridge on language policy and new speakers. Oh, very yeah. good. So um, I've got a few more months before I submit it, but today's discussion was very good. I enjoyed it very much. Very good, yeah, yeah. New speakers are very important, and so migrants are new speakers as well. So it's oh, yeah. well, that's, the topic. <laughs> divide that somebody suggested between migrants from within the same state and immigrants from outside the state. What we didn't hear much about was um, religious and cultural differences that people often learn a language. Mm -hmm. They feel imposters because they don't share the same culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. They communicate, but they don't always empathize. That's part of mm -hmm. the problem. So, um, yeah, all right. I guess. I, I want to thank you uh, as well for, for a very interesting discussion. Uh, and I'm sorry it was so, the time was, schedule was so tight, uh, but uh, so we rushed through everything. But, but obviously there's a need to, discuss, to continue the discussion also. And, and I hope to, that we could arrange something similar in, in the future. Uh, yeah. Because there's a lot of, of experience that needs to be shared and, and thoughts to be shared as well so so thank you a lot i really need to to end this meeting now so colin and, and claudine if you want to continue talking <laughs> you have to do it through another channel <laughs> the last message for me is for all the success that gwen and cites for every one person there must be thousands who don't really integrate at all and we don't really concentrate on them i won't call them failures but they are a missing opportunity aren't they for us mm. It's a challenge. Yes. A challenge. Anyway, many thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. And okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.